Welcome back to another episode of The Last Zebra. I'm your host, Ugo Ezema. And as, al- as always, please don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and comment. And today's guest is Dr. Adrian Bodhi. How are you? I'm good. How's it going, man? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much. Oh. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Really. It has. I'm glad, I'm glad you, you got me here, man. Uh, <laughs> exciting to have a conversation like this. I know we we're supposed to do something right around graduation. Uh, yeah. I think we we're supposed to sit down and have a drink or something, but... This is it. <laughs> I still remember because we were supposed to go to uh, um, Up and Adams. I don't know yeah, if you remember. Yeah. But I think, I think that day something came up and we weren't able to, to get it done. Yeah. I mean, it always happens at the end of the year. Yeah. Like everything pops up. So I understand. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you coming through all the same. I know uh, you're a busy man. Yeah. I wear a lot of hats. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself. Um. All right. So I'm, I'm born and raised. Well, I'm technically not born in New Orleans. I'm raised in New Orleans. Uh, my family's all from here. Um, my parents moved to Houston, uh, at some point my dad got a job with Shell in the oil industry and, uh, I was born in Houston and they moved, you know, six months after that Mm -hmm. back to New Orleans. So I'm essentially born and raised, but technically not born. Right. Just raised in New Orleans. Um, I grew up in Gentilly in eight ward, um, did all my education here from, you know, elementary school to high school at St. Aug. Uh, I did go for college, um, went to school at WashU in St. Louis, bounced around the Midwest, med school at Dayton, Ohio at Wright State, came back to Tulane um, in New Orleans for residency, fellowship, and they, they had me on as faculty here, and uh, the rest has been history, so that was about 10 years ago, uh, and since then, I have I've had my hands in everything, that's all I can say. <laughs> Literally. You, you're a, a nephrologist. Correct. And you've been doing... so. You started uh, your fellowship here, mm-hmm. but before that, obviously, is internal medicine, right? And before that, obviously, medical school, right? How did you? When did you know you wanted to be a doctor? Well, that's a great question. Um, I did not want to be a doctor originally. My mom wanted me to be a doctor. I know the uh, feeling because my mom's a nurse and she was like, "You should be a doctor." I was like, "I want to be a scientist." <laughs> um, and I went to school and I went to do genetics. And my mom's like, "Do pre med," and I was like, "Fine, whatever." Uh, and I was doing basic research and my PI was like, this is not for you. <laughs> like you need a job with people. And she was like, maybe you should think about medicine. And I was like, oh man, this is like the second time. Told me that. Told me that. And, um, I made that pivot cause yeah, research just wasn't for me. Basic, re- basic research, yeah. um, wasn't for me. And at that point I kind of knew I liked to talk to people. Um, I like science and I thought medicine was the perfect kind of combination so I would probably say it was my sophomore year of college when I was like, yeah, I guess I could be a doctor. Mm. But it still wasn't real. Mm-hmm. Um, so much so that I didn't take my MCAT my junior year. Like I ended up taking it my senior year. And I didn't think I was going to med school because I took it late. So I applied to like four schools. Um, yeah, my, my plan was horrible. My plan was <laughs> if I don't get to med school, I don't know anything about money. I don't know anything mm-hmm. about maintaining a house. Um, and I don't know much about research. My goal was to go work in the lab at WashU in the daytime, um, get a job at a bank so I could learn about money <laughs> and at Home Depot to learn about building. It was crazy. Uh, but luckily I got into Wright State and the rest is history. Right. Because it, that plan was horrible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so so you took your MCAT senior year and what was it? You said four medical schools you applied to? Yeah, like three or four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that? I'm sure that was nerve wracking, like going through that process. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't because I wasn't with the rest of my class. Mm. Like they were all, you know, one of my pre-med advisors was like, oh, it's too late. Don't worry about applying. You know, you miss your window, do some research, try again next year. Um, and I was like, okay. But my, my wife was my girlfriend at the time. My mom like, what's the worst that can happen if you apply? Right, right, right. And so I, I caught the people who deadline had not passed to the ones I applied to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in a place I wanted to be, um, I think I applied to Tulane, Wright State, Howard, it's like one other school, mm-hmm. and um, got in the right state, and I was like, okay, I guess this was supposed to happen. What was what was medical school like for you, especially when it it, it sounds like it was kind of thrust upon you then, mm-hmm. when you weren't anticipating that you'd probably get in that first time right. around. Right. What was that first um, year like? For me, I loved it. I like to learn for the sake of learning. Yeah. Um, it was just new information. Anytime I get new information, I'm excited. Like, yeah. I'm just excited to learn stuff. And I come home and I'd be like, hey, did you know this amino acid, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, you know, uh, me and my friends didn't have these really, like, you know, geeky med student conversations yeah, yeah, yeah. that you have uh, when you're in school. So that was 
cool for me. I was a very average student, mm-hmm. like literally 50th percentile, like right across the board. I wasn't that bad. I wasn't that good. I yeah. was just average, but I was excited to learn. Yeah. Um, for me, it was never really like trying to do well on an exam. It's just like learning what I wanted to learn. Mm-hmm. Thank God it was at a pace that my grades kept up. Right. Do you, do you, how did you decide internal medicine after medical school? Oh, that's a really, that's like another good one. I originally went to family medicine. I fell in love with talking to people, mm-hmm. families and longitudinal care. Um, I work with a guy named Morris Brown in Dayton, Ohio, who had this really cool family practice set up where he had timeshare where a cardiologist, endocrinologist would come. Oh, so wow. he made like a one-stop shop. He had uh, like a, a uh, like a small gym in mm-hmm. his practice mm-hmm. downtown. And so he'd write prescriptions for like 15 minutes on the, on the treadmill. And so people would come in before their time, get on the treadmill, walk. So I was like, that's what I want to do. Um, so I was all in, right? And then I did family, I did internal medicine first and I like love the mystery part and kind of just playing the, you know, detective. the detective when it comes to diagnosing things. And I did my family and it was so slow, you know, inpatient, mm. I think they have heart failure, you get an echo, answer. Yeah. Outpatient, oh man, his leg swelling, I think it's heart failure, refer to cardiology, <laughs> echo, <laughs> you know, you get these results in two to three months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, that was it for me. And so I kind of fell in love with that part of medicine. And then I was always drawn to the nuts and bolts, little details. And so in my head, it was always cardiology and nephrology. Mm. Luckily, I got to work with a interventional cardiology group. I did not know that it was diagnostic and interventional. And so I was like, man, these guys on call every night. They're coming to work tired. Like, <laughs> I don't want this to, rest, to be the rest of my life. And I worked with a nephrologist, Dr. Adwafo, a uh, Nigerian guy. Super awesome. Came in three-piece suits, like, you know, um, <laughs> flyest guy in the hospital, right? <laughs> Real slick. Um, and he was bouncing around the clinic, the, the wards, here, there, transplants. So he was just everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um and, you know, you always find these people that you take a liking to, and that's kind of what models you. Mm-hmm. Um, and this guy was always suited up, right? Like, he literally, the joke was that he cut his grass in, like, a three-piece suit. <laughs> like, people would joke and say, I saw him come home from work, and he pulled his lawnmower out and was cutting his grass in his three-piece suit. Uh, and I thought that was, like, so cool that this guy was always so fly. Right, um, right. And that really pulled me in. And the, the rest has been history. I just kind of love the little nuance. Um, and nephrology is kind of like medicine on steroids, mm-hmm. right? It's, like, really... The medicine-y things, but like in such a, a finite detail, right? I I love me- nephrology. My my the, the equivalent for me would be Dr. Gupta. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Shabby. Yeah, Shammy. Yeah, Shammy. And uh, he was also a guest. He was my second guest. Our second guest on the okay. show. Okay. And uh, nephrology, like you said, it's internal medicine on steroids. And I found through through him, he was when we would have like our, our rounds in the morning or morning conference, mm-hmm. right? And he would just be like, put up the numbers. Yeah. Know? Like just yeah. show the numbers. And and he can like, figure out the picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you the picture, put up the numbers. Or if uh, if someone is taking too long with a presentation, it's like, don't worry about it, put up the numbers. And yeah. he like, and that was, going back to like that detective aspect mm-hmm. of being able to just figure out what's going on by by having the raw data, and I, I thought that was so impressive. Yeah, so impressive. And he had a profound influence on us. Uh, as as that's right. Even to this day, I, I meet people from there all the time, and they talk about him. Yeah, yeah. No, he's fantastic. I wanted to be a nephrologist, but I also loved internal medicine. I, I also loved uh, the ICU. ICU. So I wanted to do. I think initially my thought was nephrology, critical care. And then, um, and then pump crit happened. Right. Right. So we, I, we were a year late in starting our, our program. I think had I we had hit the enough crit, you would have been our first one. <laughs> I would have been there. I, I loved it. I loved it. I think it goes hand in hand. Yeah. Um, and um, I interviewed for nephrology. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. 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 I interviewed for nephrology, but I, I was really, really into it. Um, how then from, from nephrology to, did you go straight into academia? Yeah, I, I have not taken a break. Um, I didn't at that point take a break in my training. Like I literally went high school, college, med school, um, you know, internship, residency, fellowship, uh, you know, academic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why academic do you think? Uh, that's a great one. I, I thought about private practice. You know, I, I'll be honest. The pay was definitely, you know, you hit the numbers and like only three nights a call and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, man, this is amazing. Um, but I kept asking us, I really like to teach. I that's what I realized at some point is I really like to teach more than anything else. I love to teach. And I asked the guy, what could I do? And he was like, well, you can teach, you know, the students and maybe like some of the NPs and nurses. And it just wasn't enough. 
to, to keep me satisfied. He's like, we all, you know, it's nephrologists. We all love to teach. And I'm like, yeah, we do. But I, do you keep that, that itch scratched? And he right. was like, well, yeah, you know, kind of this little BS answer. And I realized I would, I'd be happy with the money, but I would not be happy long term. Mm. Um, for me, that's like, I'm again, I, I read something, I get excited. I have to teach it. Mm-hmm. It could be about anything. I, I mean, I have luckily my kids are the same way. They read something crazy and they come back. Did you know? And I'm like, oh man, I did not know that. That's cool. <laughs> um, and I just think that's a part of of my you know my DNA. So I had to go in academics. I had to teach. I had to kind of spread the the knowledge and the wealth. What do you do? You find that because I, I think that there's a difference in how you teach say medical students and how you teach um, residents and especially how you teach fellows. Mm-hmm. And the way I have kind of categorized it in my mind is after your fourth year of medical, uh, being a medical student, mm-hmm. you, you have perpetual senioritis, right? So yeah, you, you finish medical school, you're like, yeah, like I know everything there is to know. I know first aid, in, the, in and out, I'm a doctor. And then oh, you, yeah. do, you do intern year and you're like, oh, wait, I know nothing. Yeah. And then you go to your second and at some point in your third year, like, oh, I'm the man. Like I, mm-hmm. I, I, I got to figure it out. Like, why am I still presenting? Yeah. <laughs> why oh, am yeah. I still presenting these cases? Like we know, I know, right. We know how to handle this. Right. 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 And then you, you subspecialize into fellowship, but I think the transition from residency to fellowship was the hardest one for me mentally, mentally especially yeah. where that senior artist component is because I am actually like a physician. Yeah. You're board certified. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Turn this yeah, Exactly. But, and then, but someone can, you know, you're still in training. So like there's still that hierarchy about the way people treat yeah. you as a trainee. But yep. mentally, I'm, I'm like, I, I don't need to do this. Like I'm actually board certified. And that that shift can be very difficult to 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 navigate. Yeah. How do you as an as an educator mm-hmm. in medicine? How do you like navigate that from medical student to resident to fellow? That's a good one. Um I use a lot of story, like literally everything I do is a story. I, I think it's because I have three small kids and we, we do a lot of storytelling and talking about stuff and I have to keep their attention. I'll still like jump in and they'll right, try to like, right, right, right. You know, and then, and then stories. So right. I have to keep it engaging and I can't, you know, I, I figured out at some point a good story beats the, the details. Right. Mm. Um, and I realized as I go along and you will probably also, the, the further along you get, the more you realize you have no idea. <laughs> right, someone said, "Oh yeah, we do, you know, like fluids. We do the the four two one rule." And I'm like, "Well, do you really know?" And they're like, "Yeah, yeah, this is what we do." And I'm like, "Well, what's the data on?" They're like, "I don't know." I say, "Well, you should probably go look at the data and see if that's applicable to adults." And they look and they say, "Well, there's no answer." You know, right, right, you start right, digging right. and you're like, "Well, I thought I knew, but actually, no one knows. No right, one's looked right, into that." And then right. you kind of you get humbled as you go up because you know, again, early on in your training, everything's black and white. And then as a resident, you get maybe sixteen bits of color, right? sixteen colors and shades of gray, and then you get like. 256 shades of gray as a fellow. And then as a faculty, you're like the 16 million shades of gray. Right. Right. right? Um, and then you realize it's okay. Not knowing. Whereas the medical students have to know the right answer because mm-hmm. they've been getting tested. Um, so for them, I'll just ask a question and they'll tell me an answer. And I'll be like, is that it? And they'll be like, yeah. And I'm like, well, prove it to me. And then they'll go try to find something. And it's always from like first aid or, you know, some like quaternary or uh, tertiary source. I'm like, find the original. And they'll go and they'll be like, I can't, that's nothing. I'm like, so there's, there's no data there, right? You, there's no answer. Um, and then they get humbled. And I think at each level, you just have to kind of ask those questions to get people to realize, yeah, there's not a, a right or wrong answer. There's just a, you know, maybe a framework or an approach or just maybe a physiologic understanding. Um, every now and then there's something that's 100%, or maybe 97% like true that we know. Um, but I think just doing that will kind of humble the fellows to maybe slow down because you know again as, a, as a, an advanced fellow you're just like I, I got it all. I know how to do this I know the procedures I know the data right and then you get one question your, your faculty are asking you're like yeah I don't know that <laughs> that's a good that's a good question yeah, right yeah, that's yeah. for me it's always yeah it's a good question and um they just learn to ask better questions or I find ways to challenge them to ask better questions as they move along I like the analogy of the the different shades as you get as you get more and more advanced, you're you're becoming more aware of the different shades. And I am I'm only three years into being an attending. I'm in my third year. And you're right. The more the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. And a part of me is is now becoming more 
the art of medicine becomes yeah. a more realistic thing as opposed to like the hard. And yeah. but I wonder if that's if that's more a reflection of identifying that each patient is a unique puzzle. Yeah. And if if that's if that's what that reflection is, like as because usually say as a medical student, a patient comes in w- with an infection. Mm-hmm. It's shock. Put on antibiotics. Yeah. Put them on pressors. Call the day. Right. As a resident, it's just, you know you 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 take a step uh, forward. Well, mm-hmm. maybe we should use this uh, this different antibiotic because they are at increased risk for gram negatives. Okay. Yeah. As yeah. a as a fellow, you're just like wait wait. We have to be careful. We can't use maybe we can't use this presser. Uh-huh. Because of the, you know, they have yeah, they have AFib yeah, and they have arrhythmogenic, exactly. yeah, yeah. So maybe we can't do that. And then maybe as an attending, you're like, well, look, like let's dial back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Maybe all they need is the antibiotics and the fluid, yeah. right? Yeah. Maybe that's all they need. And right. but our training has been, you know, along the way, there's things that you have to hit. There's certain things you have to hit to to actually, I guess, pass that training. Yeah, but the nuances of individualized care comes off as art. Like, and that's true. Yeah. And how, how different people practice that art is something I'm learning too. Like my colleagues may prefer this oh, yeah. um, to, another, you know, they prefer this antibiotic to, although they both kind of do the same thing, but right. why does preference here exactly. versus that one? And that's based on their experience too. Like, like yeah. who, who, taught them mm-hmm. and we're all just a reflection of like our previous uh attendings i think yeah and we kind of try to manifest that that's true because i have attendings who i don't use a drug in this gfr or right, you know, right. whatever and you say well why they said well when i was a resident i got burned <laughs> this patient got stephen johnson syndrome right, right, right now right. you're like whoa okay so their experience is like put this as a, a caution red flag in my head which i then put in the next person um and we you know i may not it may not drive everything but it's always in the back of my head right, so i've right, learned right. from someone you know, maybe from 50 years ago, actually, of an experience they had, which is the cool part of, of passing things down. Right, 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 right. Um, but it's all frameworks. As you go along, you develop a framework, and I just hope people can explain the framework that they're using because we don't challenge those enough. That's my big thing. It's like, oh, they like, oh, we always did it this way. And I'm like, well, why? Why do you do this? Why is this your algorithm? Why is this your approach, right? And I think if you ask more questions, you just get better answers. The quality of your questions, you know, reflects the quality of, of your outcomes, right? I've, I've heard Einstein say, um, there's this quote from Einstein when someone asked him, uh, essentially, if you have one hour to solve this equation mm-hmm. or to to act, to answer the most difficult question, the, the answer the to give us an answer, mm-hmm. how would you how would you uh, sort it? How would you figure this out? How mm-hmm. would you figure out this equation? And he said. I would spend the first 55 minutes um, asking the right questions. Mm. The, once I ask yeah. the right question, uh, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But yeah, once, yeah. once you ask the right question, the answers become much more um, apparent. Yeah, because you have to frame it and it's in this circumstance. Yeah, and that's everything, like in life. Yeah. And I think once we realize asking these questions in life, then it just makes everything easier. But I don't think people ask enough questions. I agree. And I, I struggle with that too, because sometimes I don't know how to, because it's one thing to ask the question. It's, I don't know how to like prompt that question, like how yeah. to ask the question in the first place. Like um, I, I, you said something interesting, a, a simple why, mm-hmm. how do you ask the why Yeah. without coming off as, you know, I'm challenging you or, yeah. like, you know, how do you, how do you like, express the fund of knowledge. Like, I just want, I want to know. Yeah, yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. So I, I have this, you know, I've been doing a lot with ICU right now, yeah. with residents and just kind of challenging them. And I'll ask them a simple question. How do fluids work in septic mm. patients? And I never get the answer right away. Like, because they've never thought about it. Like, all the stuff they learn is gone. Mm. They're like, well, you know, like, they, they always imagine the body as like a tank, right? And, or a vessel. And it's like, it's low. So you got to like build it up and fill the tank. And then I ask them questions, more questions, and they like they get to the point where like, oh, it's actually increased cardiac output, <laughs> and then that increases your you know arterial perfusion. And I'm like, yeah, why do you say it in the beginning? They were like, I didn't really think of it that way. Mm-hmm. So like I'm, you have to dance around for them to get to like the core of their understanding because they're just everyone's at the surface, right? We're all just floating at the surface, just grabbing whatever's there. And then you ask a few questions, they get a little deeper, and they're like, oh, I would have never thought about that. And I'm like, we should because these are like the most critical patients, right, and right. you really need to like. 
be on your A game with them. It's not just follow, 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 follow. It's it. I reflect on that. And I think about how my, cause I have two kids mm-hmm. and my daughter really, she's four. Uh, she's in the Y phase. Yeah. Of, of, it's, it's good. Of, it's, and like it, it is, an, it feels like a nuisance at times, but that is such a critical part of learning. It, yeah, learning. And it forces me to make sure that I have a better, like a better foundation yeah. or understanding as to what I'm telling her. So she, you know, she's daddy. Why is the sky blue? It's just because it is, but why? And yeah. then, like she keeps going and she keeps going and she keeps going. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> maybe I need to Google this. I actually never thought about it. You never think before. about it. Yeah. I, my son asked the same question. We had to Google this. Yeah. Um, and that my inquisitive son is now 11. Mm. So he knows to go to Google first now. <laughs> he'll, he'll ask the most, you know, asinine of questions. And he gets all in the weeds and he'll ask Google and he'll come back and he'll say, you know, the polarization of light on earth is blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. He was like, that's why sunglasses, blah, blah, blah. You know, he kind of rattles off these little details because he's dove so deep now. He understands he's like kind of, you know, quench his own yeah. uh, knowledge. Uh, yeah. uh, he, he's your oldest? He's my middle one. Middle one. Yeah. How old is your oldest? 13. What, as, as, as someone who is, um, who has an affinity for knowledge that way, what was that like discovering that your kids share that affinity? It was good and bad, like you said. The whole why phase is, is, is really draining. <laughs> Cause it's a lot of whys yeah. and you, you, you keep going. And at some point you're like, I don't have anything left. Like, I don't I know. Got for you. Yeah. Let's ask Google. <laughs> so, um, so much so that, you know, the little elf on the shelf. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, my kids, I don't know. This might've been over 10 years. It might be like nine years ago. They named them Google man. Cause you know, this is back when you can say, okay, Google, hello, Google, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, on the phone. And they were, okay, Google. And they would ask some crazy questions. So they got introduced to like asking these questions really early on. I would ask the question mm-hmm. to try to help them because I'm like, yeah, I don't know why the sky is blue and the light and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And Roy G. Biv and why is it an indigo? Is that really a color? You know, all these like things. I'm like, I just took it for what it was. How long has it been now since you since you've been out of training? Um, Ten years in June. Wow. So as a quick decade. Wow. Any any um, points of reflection about how you've grown as a as an attending, mm-hmm. as a as a man and certainly as a father, because it sounds like in that, especially in training, because you you were a dad during yeah, training. Is what during training, yeah. yeah. That's a oh, that's a good question. I I guess I've changed with my kids because mm. you know in the young phase it's all play, um, and now and I, I didn't realize how much like I kind of coach them and like push them and mold them and uh, you know their mother and I would kind of like you know you, you try to mold the children and you realize at some point they have personalities mm-hmm. and they're gonna do what they want for the most mm-hmm. part. Um, I learned to stop asking why. That was more than just the kids. That kind of was life. Um, mm-hmm. I started doing some coaching training and things like that. Because as a nephrologist and someone interested in physiology, I'm always asking why. What's the mm-hmm. mechanism behind it? But in human behavior, you can't ask why. I've, I've learned in coaching. Because mm. um, people rationalize. So you never really ask a person why they did something. Because they are not going to give you a true answer. They're going to give you the answer they think you want to hear. Right? So in coaching, that's a big thing. Is you're like, oh, you know, this happened. Well, why did you do that? No, that's, a, that's a no-no in coaching. Really? Yes. So what's what's the question? Uh, you could just reframe it in multiple ways, but when people hear why, they make up an answer. Mm. You know, like with kids, why would you write on the wall? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, they can't tell you, but yeah. they're gonna say something they think you want to hear, and be like, why, why? And then they'll say, I just thought it. would. they just say stuff, and, yeah, he, yeah, and adults yeah. do it too. We all rationalize. You know, why did you choose this? Well, you know, I really like this car and blah, blah, blah. No, you didn't. You wanted the status, you know, that it means. Right, right, you, right. You can't right. verbalize it or maybe, you know, you just don't know the underlying reasons, but you don't know why. Right. So I stopped asking, because I used to do the five whys with like when I sit down with trainees, um, like Toyota has this kind of five whys. What are they? So to get to the root cause of any actual issue, you have to ask five whys. Okay. For example, um, these cars, um, they have problems with the ignitions, um, you know, in the park setting. Well, Why? Oh, maybe it's because the ignition um, is not calibrated for a weight of blah, blah, blah on the keys. Well, why? Well, when we were building the machine, we used, you know, these so-and-so ball bearings, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. Well, why? Well, because the cost. So you can go five levels deep and then you get to root cause like, oh, mm-hmm. it was a cost issue maybe. Or, you know, the, um, the, the shuttle that exploded, right? It was the O-rings, right? If you go back deep enough, it's the O-rings uh, for the temperature. It, it couldn't do it. That's why the O-rings kind of gave up, right? Because mm-hmm. they tested it at a different temperature. So when it comes to like manufacturing, you can ask those questions, right? Anything like a physical process. Right. Human beings, you cannot do that. And that's the biggest change. I've learned to just stop asking my children why. I just be like, 
okay, I understand your prefrontal cortex is not all there. You're just out here making crazy decisions <laughs> and you're not really thinking about it because you're acting in the moment. So I think that's the biggest as a as a parent is mm-hmm. to like stop asking them why mm. um, and just understand they don't know. They're just reacting. I, I guess that's, I, I, is that accepting them for where they're at? Yeah, exactly. Like, and, and does that translate well to adults, you find? Um, yeah, I think with adults is we all have hidden motives that we either we don't know about mm-hmm. or we don't want to put in public. Um, a lot of times it's status with adults, almost everything is status with adults, but there's always something kind of under the surface, mm-hmm. right? We always have these internal stories we tell ourselves, um, whether or not that's true, we might believe it. Right. Um, and so if you ask why, you know, well, why do you spend your money this way? Because I need to do this because I need this kind of car and like people will justify it. Right. Mm-hmm. And they may have never really thought why. Um, so it's, it's somewhat consistent in adults. They just may not know the why either. Right. Is there a way to, you know, if, you, if you're going to do like personal reflection, is there a way that like you can ask yourself the why's? Just right. Just right. Just right. Mm. Like some, something's in the subconscious and it'll come out. And I've noticed that kind of journaling, which I don't do very regularly, but like mm-hmm. every now and then you'll write, um, or even if you're speaking out loud, yeah, like you're just talking, it comes to the surface. You're like, hmm, where did that come from? Because <laughs> um, I've done coaching and you're talking, and I'm like, oh, I, I, didn't, I never thought about that before. Right, right. It just came out today. What, you, you've brought up coaching now. So you actively search, like sought out trying to be a, a better mentor? Yeah, so... Um, Dealing with the residents and the mm-hmm. fellows um, and even the, the kind of graduate medical education program as a whole, I was like, we probably need some kind of coaching because, you know, I don't know if you've had coaching, but it, it's a solutions based um, practice, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're looking for outcomes and you have the individual, the coachee, kind of figure out how to get there. Right. Mm. And for our trainees, for better or worse, you know, they may have some issues where they don't realize why they're doing something. Um, and you really don't want to know why, but you just want to help them with a solution that mm-hmm. they already know the answer to um, get to it. Right. I've, I've had students like, for example, one student told me he did not study on Sundays. Like we were talking about he was not doing well. And we sat down and I'm kind of advising him. And he's like, I don't study on Sundays. And I'm like, oh, why? That's just my practice. I, don't, I was like, oh, is it a religious reason? And like, you know, nope. I didn't study in college and didn't, don't study now. I'm like, but you are failing. <laughs> uh, and he's like, yeah, but, you know. I'm like, that's like number one change. How about you just do that? And he's like, uh, you know, he kind of had all these reasons why he just studied was his, Sunday was his day. Right, right, it's right. It's like, that's right. my day. I relax. And I'm like, you don't have to have that. Like, if you don't have a core belief in that Sunday is like your whatever day, if you know, non-religious or whatever, I think you could change that. Right, right, right. right, right. Um, and eventually he did. But it, it took a lot of like prodding for such a simple thing. Mm-hmm. And this is when I realized like, okay, we I have to meet people at their level and getting trained would be useful as a skill to provide to um, the residents and the fellows. I, I do find that we don't, by default, uh, physicians, especially in academia, you kind of thrust, thrust into these roles mm-hmm. that do require to be, I mean, the, the, the very function of the role is to be a, a coach and yeah. to be a mentor. Yeah. But we don't have that kind of training. We actually don't. I think we just accept that by going through medical school, residency, mm-hmm. fellowship, and so on and so forth, that that training is embedded into it somewhere. Yeah, it's so, just the modeling, right? Yeah. We, you see the attending, and the resident tries to be like the attending, yeah. and the intern tries to be like the resident, and the student tries to be like exactly. the intern. Yeah. But it's it. Yeah, you know, as you're as you're saying, there's so much more to, and I, medicine is probably the only field or one of the few fields where that is the case. Like. You can go straight mm-hmm. into being. Oh yeah, with no training. With no training. Yeah, no training. It's crazy. Straight into leadership with no true leadership training. Yeah. You just accept that. And they keep pushing you up. Yep. So if you happen to be good at this, then you get this, and you're good at this, you get this. But there's no, you know, a lot of times we don't know why, but we're just like well, good people are going to find their way to the top. We always right, kind of right, say right. that. Oh, they just figure it out. I've, of course, <laughs> you sought out that that training. Mm-hmm. What was what? And you mentioned like you know you had some experiences are like, well, maybe it would be a good idea for us to, to get, is that something that you would encourage? And at what level would you say like, guys, we should, we should probably get this into as part of our thing. Like where, mm-hmm. as you're going through this medical, you know, ladder, going up this medical ladder at some level, get, get some sort of mentorship training or coaching training. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a good one. I, 
and I know we're trying to do it on certain levels like boot camps, mm-hmm. but those are more seem like they're focused on like clinical skills or like um, maybe even time management skills mm-hmm. as opposed to like some of the leadership skills. Mm-hmm. I think you're you you we actually have it kind of the highest highest levels right mm-hmm. like people all the way up get executive coaching mm. right because um, we figured out hey right. this person is the, the boss they need to be effective in their role right and you are seeing at more and more medical schools I want to say probably a third of medical schools have some kind of coaching program separate from mentoring mm. for like trainees students you know some some degree but I do think in, you know, working with, with Deepa Bhatnagar, we are trying to put together like an advising, a mentoring and a coaching kind of piece of three separate entities. Uh, Cause the coaching pieces is like, you tell me what you want to work on and then I'm going to help you figure out what you need to do to get there. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, the advising is someone who's in the role normally and kind of telling you what to do to get to whatever, you know, career level. Mm-hmm. Um, and mentoring is someone who's kind of just walking through with you. All right. You have issues, you kind of model after them as well. Um, I don't know if you have any professional mentors. I have, I have, uh, at least two. I, I'd need to be a better mentee about keeping up to keeping up with them. Yeah. But, um, I don't know. I don't know if there, cause now I'm thinking about it. Are there, is there a difference between, and or at least what's the, is there a difference between a mentor and someone you look up to? Right. And mm-hmm. someone you emulate. Yeah. Does that count as a, a, a as a mentor? As yeah, well? That's a mentor. Yeah. Mm. Someone that has clearly gotten where you want to get and you could just follow their footsteps. Right. Right. Yeah. I'll call it a mentor. And that could be official or unofficial. OK. Because then in that case, there are a few people that um, I, I can think about that. I am I I'm particularly impressed about their path mm-hmm. and how they've executed their you know journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and I look up to. In that sense, but I don't think I have a formal mentor, which is probably something that would be beneficial now that I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to get there quicker. That's, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, you can stumble your way to whatever goal (laughs) you want, which is what most of us do, right? We kind of just stumble along the journey and then we figure it out. Um, But if you have a formal mentor that is, I don't know, if you say, I want to be, I don't know what your goal is, but Mm -hmm. if you, you get there, and that person's there. Mm-hmm. And you say, well, how'd you get from where I am to the next level? Or what are the levels I need to get? Like, is it here to here to here to here? Or they'd be like, no, it's two levels, here and here. And what you need to do first to get to here is this. And then what I did to get from here to here is that. Mm. And then you know, okay, this is what I need to put all my energy at, right? Instead of like, um, I show work, I do this, I do this, they got this going. Like, we do just have so many things normally, and we figure out which ones work, and then we keep going in that direction. And yeah, I need to do that then. I need to... And how, do, how does one parse through the litany of people that you can because you know there's no interview process really yeah um i always say be careful because but i did it when i was probably a fellow i made a list of like people who i was impressed by like draw history mm-hmm. um like this person was a great leader this person had you know, great managerial skills this person great communication skills and kind of like modeled after these like mm-hmm. super famous people or whatever right um and when i was coming to like leadership and management i i was like let me key in on, on jack welsh right jack welsh was like you know, uh, executive of the, of the decade and blah, blah, blah. And then I started getting the nitty gritty. And I'm like, this dude was horrible, <laughs> right? Like, um, you know, GE was great when he was there, but he destroyed destroyed the company or, you know, took it down to a notch where like, G's no longer where it used to be, right? Because mm-hmm. all these practices are very short term mm-hmm. and not longitudinal things that you could do to keep, you know, uh, a company going right. in the right direction, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, he spun off this and then, you know, all these layoffs. And it's just like not a great, once I dug deep enough, I was like, this is not who I want to be. It's not how I want to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's good, too, because you can figure out people who are not going to be helpful for you. And and that's important, too, right? Like, it's probably more important yeah. than find out the person. That might be the first thing to do is to have yeah. A, yeah, figure out who would not be a good uh, mentor. Yeah. But th- th- that's someone that's already on your list that you're you're kind of like, yeah. you're diving deep and you're, you're kind of removing them based off of those things. Right. Um. When someone comes to you, when a, a student, a fellow resident comes to you and says, hey, I would, I would like mm-hmm. to be your mentee, what are your criteria? Like, because I'm sure you don't say yes to everyone. Right? I do. I say yes to everyone. Oh, you do? Yeah, I'm very bad at saying no. Okay. I'm at the phase of my life now where I think I need to start saying no more. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the first 10 years, it was yes to everything. Mm-hmm. I turned nothing away. Um, hence why I wear so many hats. <laughs> um, but you learn a lot and you start learning to say no but I think for people, because um, my ultimate legacy, I think, is going to be based on the, the students and the trainees I work with. Mm. For me, it's all leverage. You know, 
money is it'd be great to have all the money in the world but it's even more important to have that much influence because mm. um, for me it's all about leverage right mm-hmm. it's the time you put in versus the the rewards and outcomes mm-hmm. and for me to influence you know maybe if I got one student and one resident a year that I influence and they influence another student another resident it becomes exponential mm-hmm. right and I could probably improve patient care with just these small interactions more than I could individually on my patients. Right, 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 right. So for me, it's that leverage and like really influencing this group of people, uh, I think is like, that's the most important to me. That's why I think education is great. Cause you can, I can go back to my fourth grade teacher, Mr. Snyder and how what his words influenced me to, to do this and focus on science and you know, uh, so that's way more important to me. I don't say no to any person that asks me for help or assistance. What, what, are, what are qualities that you would say would make someone a really good mentee then? Um, asking good questions and follow up. Follow up is the most important. Um, if you're a mentee, if you look at, you know, the value of the time that you spend with somebody, the mentor's time value is a little bit more because they don't have as much time. They're further down the road. Um, they probably have more responsibilities. And if you, you know, put a a dollar amount and say yours is a hundred per hour and that person's is 500 per hour. Don't waste that person's time. Right. Right. right, right. But you you could blow that time off. You know, you're you're 22, whatever. I'm going out tonight. That person's not going out. They get up at 6 a.m. They're going to the gym. They're doing stuff with their kids. They're teaching in their community. Um, So you just don't want to waste that time. So if you guys talk about something, the next time you meet, you should have followed up on it. Like Mm -hmm. just be accountable. That's the most important. I think the follow up is probably, like you said, it's probably, like you said, it's the most important thing. And it's probably the thing that most people don't, that that's what they do the least of. Yeah. Right. You know, you, there's no circle back. Um, mm-hmm. so I, when I find my mentor, which I'm going to do a deep dive into yeah. now, I'm going to need to uh, make sure I do that follow up. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what impresses them, right? They, because you're going to go back, man, I got this one guy. I mean, I have a, a mentee. He's at Howard Med right now. Um, and he worked with me and he worked with another local doc. And, you know, we were talking then he would do something. He would come back and kind of close the loop and like, I did this and I'm doing this and I'm, mm-hmm. I got in this program. I'm doing a research. I'm like, okay. You know, like I'm impressed by that. And the, the students who, who follow up or you give the advice and they do it, you're always way more impressed. Right. You're, you're the second guest that we've had that actually said the exact same thing. Um, Dr. Simmons, she's a urologist. Um, she is very pro mentorship mm-hmm. and she, she herself is an advocate for, you know, cold outreach like yeah. making sure like reach out to people that you want to like have some sort of influence in you or mm-hmm. someone you want to learn from yeah and make sure you follow up mm-hmm. so yeah and, and she she made the she she made the case about there there are times when the only interaction she's had with people are digital and then when they so for years they've had digital interaction email text phone call mm-hmm. and then many years later they meet in person but that still feels like a genuine relationship because of that follow. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, what I, I know you do your uh, the the pepper. Uh, oh yeah, the hot sauce. Hot sauce. Yeah. You still doing that? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, actually about to expand the the line. So right now it's the, the original New Orleans style hot sauce. We're getting ready to do it. Um, mango habanero and then a uh, Thai chili. How how did that start? My patience. Just listen to the patient. Yeah, yeah, Because, yeah. you know, as a nephrologist, we, we talk a lot about low-sodium intake in patients with advanced kidney disease. And, um, you know, we always, oh, make sure you're not, you're being careful how much salt you add. You know, this is how much you should put it. You, you should do each day. Read the labels. We explain that. Um, and in the begin- very early on, people were like, oh, I don't use any salt. I'm like, okay, do you use any of this, this, and this? Oh, yeah, I use this, and I use this, and I use hot sauce. And I'm like, well, you know, why don't you grab the peppers, you know, get some peppers, yeah, put them in vinegar, you know, the mm-hmm. old school way, like mm-hmm. this, my great grandparents used to do, you know, pick peppers off the bush and they put them in a jar and vinegar and they, you know, use that. Um, and people say, okay. And he never did it. Cause you got to make it easy. It has right, to be right, you right. Know, frictionless for people to actually move on it. Um, and I don't know why I just started making it one day. So you made it at home? At home. Oh yeah. On the stove, <laughs> mason jar. Um, I started off with ghost peppers. It was way too hot. My dad was kind of my, my test yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. person. I don't want to say test. I mean, he was my test person. And um, I'd be like, hey, try this. And he'd be like, it's way too hot. Yeah. It was crazy. And the next one, he'd be like, I don't like that. And so I kept playing with it. And he was like, this is a good one. And when he would come back and get more, I was like, all right, it's, it's where it needs to be. Yeah. Um, and then I would give it out to patients, the mason jaws, et cetera. And they would come back. And when they would come back and be like, hey, can I get some more of this? I was like, oh, okay. Um, you know, next visit, I'll make sure I bring some. And then that same patient, um, Mr. V, he came back and he was like, you know, you should just sell this stuff. I'm like, Huh. And that's kind of, I was like, okay, let me formalize this. Um, 
Because there was nothing on the market. Like when it came to low sodium bread, I'm like, here's Ezekiel bread, you know, mm-hmm. low sodium. This is low sodium. You guys like hot sauce? There's no low sodium option. It wasn't at the time. There's, I think, at least one other um, option now, but uh, probably two. Um, but I was like, you need just, you know, try that. And, you know, it helped people um, to just kind of spice up the food. Give them a little something because, to be honest, if food spicy, sometimes you don't need the saltiness, right? right? right, you, right, really, right you just right. need like a little sourness, right? Yeah. You hit most of these things, you, just, you need a little umame, and then it kind of comes together as much, and you won't need as much salt. Right. So for my patients who are eating fried chicken uh, in New Orleans, if they're putting hot sauce on it anyway, and it's, the fried chicken is already super salty, you just need the heat, right? Right, right, right. Um, so that's what it was originally kind of created to just add to your food to not add extra salt. I, and, and I think... Prior to meeting you, I had never actually thought of hot sauce as a high sodium um, thing. Hey, Louisiana hot sauce is. Oh, it's there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what's the name? What's the name of the? Um, uh, Doc's Salt Free. Doc's Salt Free. We're going to have to, we'll put some, we'll put the link to the show notes. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, so I'm not creative, right? Like. <laughs> Doc Salt Doc Free. Salt free. I was, I've been busy. I'm just like, what do you call it? I don't know. Doc Salt Free hot sauce. I thought it's applicable because we have a barbecue sauce now too. So it's Doc Salt Free barbecue sauce. How many flavors you got um, we had an original in the strawberry hot sauce, um, cause you know, Louisiana's got a lot of strawberries yeah, and yeah, ponchatoula yeah. and stuff. So we, we, we did that for a while and that was kind of a seasonal variety, which we might bring back for the holiday. Um, but we have hot sauce, barbecue sauce. We had Italian dressing, which is, we're on back order right now and we're going to end up having more flavors of the hot sauce. What's your process right now then? So my process, um, from, from, from doing it in your kitchen. Oh yeah. It's pretty automated now. Yeah. Um, I have a co-packer, so I place the order, my co-packer, um, I order my labels, I order all my mm-hmm. stuff. I already did my FDA testing. I created the logo. It's like me in Photoshop. <laughs> I made the logo. <laughs> like, I made everything. I made the website, yeah. you name it. I did it all. Yeah. Um, the AdWords is me. Um, but I ordered my labels, send it to my co-packer, my co-packer. When I get it four to six weeks later, they do a process run. Um, at this point now, it's, it is where it is. It's perfect. I don't have to keep going and testing it. They do it. They box it. They send it to me, me and my team, which is like normally my kids, my, my uh, fulfillment people. They box it and we send it to Amazon for FBA. Fulfillment ah. by Amazon. Wow. Is it, is, it, uh, is it what you thought it would be? Or you didn't th- really think about it to be this it. thing? Yeah, I'm just enjoying the process. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> To be yeah, honest, yeah. like, you know, you oh, it'd be great if I could blah, 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 but... At this point, it's really just focusing on the, the process. Um, what other things are, are you engaged in, um, extracurricular or outside of medicine? I had my first little bout of uh, basketball coaching. I was assistant coach um, with my boys' team this year. Yeah, so that yeah, was yeah. interesting. What was that like? Uh, it's fun. It's hard with also other people's kids. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great as an assistant coach. I'm yeah. glad I'm not the head coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a different level of stress um, with all those kids and the parents. Um, for me, it's just kind of helping out, um, being there, you know, showing them how to run drills, little small things, how to move feet, how to pivot, you know, the really small stuff at a young age that makes it kind of easy and fun. Um, so I'm doing some of that. Gosh, what else do I do? Um, getting up to coaching stuff. So right now it's going to be for trainees in the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, may open it up to physicians, um, practicing physicians mm-hmm. um, and non-physicians. I'm thinking about doing some pro bono work. Uh, I would love to like focus coaching on like young Af- African-American men. Mm. Um, I would love to start my high school first, St. Aug. So uh, I'll talk to them first, see if I can get something like that going. Um, purple Knight. Yeah, the Purple Knights. Yep. Um and that's really it for right now. Family takes up so much of my time. Mm. Like, I mean, the season of my life is the family season. I understand. Um, St. Aug, who, who was it? Carl Withers? Mm-hmm. I did not know until her past that he's, well, I did not know, one, that he's from New Orleans, yeah. and then two, that he went to St. Aug. Yeah. 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 St. Aug has some esteemed um, Yeah, we got, we got alumni. Some, some heavy hitters yeah. uh, as far as alumni goes. Yeah. Big and small. Right. Um, you hear about the really big names, but locally, you know, politics, and, mm-hmm. you know, around the city, we actually have some some big names. And it's a public school, right? It's private. It's private? I did not know that. Yeah. Is it, how do you feel about the education here? Now you have, you have kids, yeah. obviously. Here, um, and are they at St. Aug, any of them? Uh, my oldest is going next year. Okay. Yeah, so okay, he starts okay. ninth grade next year. Got you. How do you feel about the education here? Because it's it's so challenging, and it is. We're, we're we're about to get our my daughter. She's four, turning five, and so she's in. She's about to go into pre K. She's leaving daycare, mm-hmm. and I was not aware 
prior to going through this process about how education here in in uh, New Orleans can be. It's complicated. Very complicated. Yeah, man. And I still don't have a good grasp of it. My wife works um, in the school system, mm-hmm. so she understands it way better than me because now school's way more complicated than when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but my parents were just like, yeah, this is crazy. You're just going to Catholic school. So they, you know, I've been to Catholic school from kindergarten to, to high school. Mm. Uh, and for my older two, I put them in private school. And my youngest isn't. He's in a, one of the charter schools here that we, that we like. So it, it's, it's complicated. I have a unique view of it. And I don't know if other people share my view, but I'm, I'm, I don't think New Orleans focuses on education. And I don't mm. think they ever will because... You, you focus on the needs of your city, right? Mm. So if I'm somewhere where I have multiple tech companies, right? I need to make sure I'm producing enough people to go in the tech industry. Well, what's New Orleans known for? Tourism. Yeah. yeah. Hospitality, right? And it, New Orleans has a unique brand of hospitality, right? You really need locals to kind of, that's like the draw of it. You come in, you hit people talking, hit accent. Yeah, baby. And, you know, mm. people love that about New Orleans. And so you can't outsource that. So, you, you know, unfortunately, those jobs are going to be jobs that don't require a lot of education. Mm. Um, unfortunately, if the jobs required a certain degree of education, we'd have better education. Like the, the money will be put there. The effort will be put there. So I don't want to say that the system is designed for it, but the system's not designed to not, you know, have that happen. Right, right, right. Um, I think that's, a, that, that's, a, that's certainly a unique perspective, but it's one that I think... That makes a lot of sense, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, if if the wow, <laughs> and, and if, I think the superintendent's trying their best. Everyone's trying their best, right? Right. But with what they have, right? And if the money's not there, I don't care what you do. It's not going to improve, right? right. Um, the teachers are trying, the schools are trying, the administrators are trying. Everyone's trying, right? But I think you're you're trying with limited resources, limited resources, and you're only going to get so much out of it, right? That's a great point. That's a great point. Like, if if our you know, whole thing is, like you said, the hospitality. Yeah. If the education level just goes up, we kind of lose that because less people will be doing those jobs. Yeah, and those jobs, we don't have as many of those jobs, if you know, in the city. Right. So people are going to leave and we'll get this brain drain and then now you're in trouble. Right. I mean, this is a city, you know, I think you go pre-COVID, I think New Orleans had almost 18 million visitors. Mm. There's 350,000 people in the city of New Orleans, right? So I don't know how you service that many tourists if you don't have the workforce. And I, I think it's often forgotten that New Orleans is really a village of a city. It's not. It's, it's not tiny. A, yeah, it's not a real city the way. It's not a real American city in the way you think about American cities. It's a historic American city. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's 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 landlocked, yeah. right? So it, the lake up top, yeah. the, and the the river kind of just. It's a small geographical space, right? And there isn't a lot of space. Right. So the for prices it. are, you know, increased. So yeah. it, it's it's a tough, it's a tough city um, to make things work. And I know people try, you know, the Silicon Bayou stuff, and we try mm-hmm. tech stuff. Um, there are angel investment groups here. You know, there have been some pretty decent companies that have actually come out of New Orleans. I yeah. think um, what is it, Squid do or one of like the three D modeling companies mm. actually came out of New Orleans. So there's there's stuff that can still come out. Um, just at the scale we need for the city to grow, unfortunately, I don't think it's there. Um, I have a, a, a question about, this is a family planning question. It's very, very bizarre. Okay. But <laughs> two to three, mm-hmm. how'd you go from two, two kids to three? Because it's we've been given, a lot of people give us like, once you hit two, everyone gives you advice. Just, you know, either stop or... Oh yeah, two to three is different. <laughs> Everybody I talk to two to three is different because two you can play man to man. You get right, to three, right. you got to run a zone. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's harder to run a zone. You're right. Because you can't be everywhere. All you know, you got to keep moving, and it's exhausting. Um, yeah, three kids is a lot more difficult. Mm. Um, yeah, I would just say that your your your, your time allotments change with three kids. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I because we're t- I, I think that three is probably the the, the perfect balance mm-hmm. and in terms of just in general, like a, a five, five individual household, mom, dad, yeah, three kids. It's fun. Yeah. It's, fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, the, the idea of having two, like you said, man to man and moving to, Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's, it's different. Um, but it's way more fun. I cannot imagine not having three kids. Right. 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 Um, I always had friends who had three. It was, I only had two. It was me and my brother. Uh, 
but three is like my brother has three kids now. I have three. I have a cousin who just had his third. And it's like the dynamic is very different, but it's way more fun. Right, right, right. They just, the way they pair up and they click up and they play, they can have way more play. They don't get as bored as easily. Right. So, yeah. If you couldn't be a physician today, what would you do? If I couldn't? Mm hmm. Oh, that's a really good question. I don't know if I ever thought about that. I always say I'd, I'd be a physician for almost free for what I do. I said this when I was a resident. I was like, you know, they can pay me this, this little base amount of money and I'd be happy with it. Um, so I would do this for almost nothing. Well, you couldn't do this. But if I could not do this, mm -hmm. I don't think I've thought that far. I do think often, though, that being a physician, um, I don't want to say hinders me, mm. but it's kept me comfortable. Mm -hmm. Like too comfortable. I'm not like, I feel like I'm not using all my skills. Um, what, are, what are some skills that you, that you have that you wish you would use? I, like gra I did graphic design in college, um, like not as a major, just like. Right, right, right. Just for fun. Bootleg copy of uh, Photoshop, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, in college. And me and my roommate were just making stuff all day long. Like we just, you know, we were addicted to Photoshop. Yeah, I don't know yeah, if you yeah. get that, that bug back in the day. Um, so I really fell in love with that, making flyers, you know, doing all this stuff. Um, I would love to be in this like creator space. That's what I was about to ask. But it's a hard space to be in. It's a hard space to be in. Um, and I see creators like getting burned out now, which I'm like, man, they have, they have their own thing they're making. They're getting burned out. So I think it's just the way of the world now. But um, that would be fun to try. I don't know if I would be successful at it. So if if I, I think probably then a better way to ask it is if you didn't have if it had no repercussion for it. Mm -hmm. So the you don't have to worry about money, like finances. I teach in high school. I, I teach there high school. Go. Yeah, that's my plan. When I finish, you know, teach I'm going to really? teach high school at least really? for 10 years. That's awesome. You make a big impact in high school. Mm. Like if you go back and think about some of your high school teachers, like you make really big impacts. Especially when you start pouring into the kids and like you get some like positive you know, reinforcement, which you don't really get that much of in high school. You get a little bit. But when you do have the one teacher... Like, I know you could do so much better. Like, or I see you, when you get that, that changes everything. Yeah. Cause you know, in high school, you're not sure of yourself. Um, you're still kind of developing your brains, developing, you're figuring out things. And when someone says, man, you did really great at this. I like the way you, that's like gas in your tank. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. they put I, that battery in your back. I have many, many, many friends that are in education. I have a, a, a profound respect uh, for people that choose. Cause it's a, it, it really is a lifestyle. Like to choose to be in education um, and that, that would only be when I retire. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I don't think I could just drop everything and do it now. It, it's hard. That is really hard. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it, it takes a lot of your, your, it takes a lot of your person to yeah. pull that off. Like, because that passion has to come from deep within mm -hmm. and it, it takes a piece of you. Right. Cause, yeah. and, and so much I, I'm reflecting now on some of my like favorite teachers, the teachers that had the most impact on me. Um, I think of them often, right? So right. like you may not speak to them for years to come, but mm -hmm. you know, you, you think about, Oh, Mrs. This would say, or Mr. That would say, yeah. or, you know, yeah. and how, how deeply they've, they've become sort of a cornerstone of how you process your world. That's a really, yeah, they, they really are. They're impactful. Yeah. And it's, you know, you want to be significant. You want to be impactful. You kind of want to leave a legacy and, Teaching, again, I can remember every teacher I've ever had from when I was five. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything else where I can remember that. Like That's you know, true. That's true. I mean, and you spend so much time with them. Yeah. You have almost a whole year yeah. in the classroom and this person is correcting you, guiding you, pushing you. So. Yeah. Uh, the Pelicans. Yeah. How you feeling? <sighs> when B.I. got hurt, my heart broke. I Literally the day before I was talking to some friends and I was like, the Pels are we got this. We're going all the way. This is the year. I'm putting my, my faith in them. And they were like, I don't know about that. And then B.I. gets hurt the next day. And I was like, damn, I jinxed them. Um, I still feel We're good. a piece away. I don't know what the piece is. I think it's Trey Murphy taking that jump. He's, he's so inconsistent. I want him to be less reliant on the three. Yeah. And I want him to be more of a dynamic player. Mm -hmm. um, he has the athleticism. Yeah, he has everything. He, he has everything to be. Um, I remember last year I was telling uh, one of my friends, I, I, this is going to sound blasphemous, but I, he could be our Kobe Bryant. He has a skill set. He just doesn't have the drive. Yeah, it, it, he could really be. I mean, if he, if he just like, like works on driving, 
his decision making is not great. I know. So works on yeah. If he works on driving and you you have an excellent shot. Yeah. Just don't always make it. On it. it. Yeah. yeah. He relies on it. Yeah. And That's the problem. When you can shoot from anywhere on the floor, like, and he might hit two of them in a row. It's like, why am I drive? Like, yeah. I'm not getting checked back here. But nobody's stopping you when you go up. Yeah. You saw that he, he he had a dunk um maybe three games ago where he went up and the the, the defenders went up. Oh, yeah, and he bodied up and just kind of finished on the left side. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I yeah. mean, he's capable of that. He's six he, nine with long arms and super athletic. Yeah. And, and he can when, shoot. Yeah. And when he's locked in on defense, he's a he's a he's a you know, he's a decent defender. He was drafted as a D and three player. Yeah. And the D just kind of lagged now from his three. But yeah, if Trey Murphy, Murphy can take that next step, we could um we're, we're in. He just hasn't taken it. This is contract year, right? I think so. Because the other thing is this. If because we know our two primary um stars mm-hmm. are so injury prone. Yeah. When one of them goes down, as we're experiencing right now, and yeah. he's required to be that primary one of the primaries. Yeah. Um the inconsistency doesn't help at all. So like, like Trey Murphy can score 25 a game. Easily. Easy. But it's just not consistent. That's all we need. If Trey Murphy can score 25 a game, the Pels are top the three. Top three yeah. 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 He just needs to jump. I'm very proud of Zion. I'm yeah, very man, pr- he figured it I, out. That's my boy. I'm very proud of him. I am also, I think, an uh, uh, unspoken hero here is CJ McCollum. Yeah. Who has completely changed his game. To, yeah. to, to accommodate the team. He's had right. to. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, you're at that like entail of your career where you kind of have to change it up and, and see where you, he steps up and scores when he needs to. Um, he does everything. He does all the little stuff. I wish he was a little bit better on ball defender, but he's been a primary scorer mm-hmm. or, you know, number two scorer for most of his career. So it's kind of hard to do now. Is, is it, is, so yeah, it's Trey, but I also think I, I have mixed feelings about JV. Jones Valentinus. He is way past his uh, expiration date. <laughs> like, um, I'm, I'm, every time he plays, I'm like, he's giving us a lot. Yeah. He's so big, man. And he's present. Yeah. He's present. He's there. I always wonder if he's got the, the, the energy to finish the game off because I never see him late in the game. Yeah. But I think. Oh, if there might be coaching lineups. Yeah. I, um, I, I was very, I've, I was wary of um, um, Willie like a couple, like a year ago mm-hmm. when I, I felt like he, he was learning on the job, yeah. but that was very frustrating as well. Because that's lineups like, were yeah, yeah it's like a, that, that's not really making sense to me. Like why certain players weren't getting more minutes? Mm-hmm. Or I think Hawk, Hawkeye is my like man. We we really dropped the ball at one point. I was like, this guy's number three on Rookie of the Year, uh, I, and we just let him just like stop. That I don't understand. Like he he also has tremendous potential. Yeah, but everyone says like Trey's potential is so much higher. You can't take Trey's minutes and give it to him. I know because if again if Trey can make the jump. Everything changes. They can't. You don't think they could play together? They can. They can. But I mean, as far as giving the time for development, you in trade. You know, coming off the bench, you you got to give him the time to to get the reps and. To and I guess it out. we have time with Hawk. We still have time to kind yeah. of get embed him into the system and all that. Yeah, because his ups. I don't think he has the upside, Trey Murphy. I mean, he doesn't have the size, the height, the defensive presence. Shooting is crazy though. Um, he's Boy, he's gonna be like a JJ Redick once he figures it out. Um, like Kyle Cooper, somebody who. He's gonna shoot probably sixty percent from behind the line at some point. I would not be surprised. I, I'm, I'm, there's a way that basketball is being played now that's very frustrating to me. I don't like the the, the heavy dependence on threes, yeah. and like players are literally just three point shooters. Like they'll just stand in the corner and shoot threes. But yeah. when I when I go to the, you know, I play basketball sometimes at the JCC. Uh-huh. Like we're not doing that. Like I wish we. I wish the the professionals played basketball the way we play basketball when, yeah. we're, when we're in the you know in the park and yeah but L- little kids play like that now though three oh yeah they shoot threes oh, oh yeah oh my goodness yeah my kids the playoff game they lost uh one of the kids hit like three threes in a row yeah that was it that was missed, it. missed the rest of them just started jacking <laughs> the rest of the game um i mean because they went up against the team they were they lost to multiple times they yeah, went up yeah. by like 10 points and they were like they're feeling themselves and kept jacking threes and it was if i was if i was a coach i think this is I've, I've said this to a few of my like friends when we talk about basketball i would coach twos twos and layups because if you're down mm-hmm. this is my logic if you're down um keep you you, you want to keep plugging away yeah like slowly like the three is like is to me is a is a a mental thing about like trying to get there yep. too quickly. Yep. So if you're down 10 points, that's 
five twos. Yeah. And you, if you make a couple of layups, you get fouled. That's a hard, like you can get three other ways. Yeah. If you're up, still keep taking twos. Yeah, you should. Yeah, because then you meant like you're yeah, going you're to stretch get, it out. Yeah. yeah, you're going to get like so. I, I the cornerstone of my coaching would be twos, 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 twos. and th- twos and lay, like go for the easy layups. Yeah, go for the twos. Um, shoot threes only when they're available. Don't yeah. don't don't execute your offense for the three. The three should only be essentially a, a last resort. Like I would go that way. Of I course, agree, but I know the metrics now. The, the I know. threes is worth this much in the grand scheme because the percentages they calculate out, and it's also it's like I don't know some psychological. When you hit a three, it's like boom now, right? It used to be what a dunk used to be in the nineties. When you hit a three, it's like everyone jumps up. You're excited. If you miss a three, you're like, mm, right? If you miss a two pointer, you're like, what the hell are you doing, yeah, right? Yeah, you're supposed yeah, to make yeah. that versus if you make it, you're just like, okay, it's layup. Versus you know if it's a dunk, okay. But um, I think the plus of hitting a three. In the small subtraction psychologically versus the the miss of a layup, I think the three psychologically, you know, it does a thing. It's more, it's so exciting now. <sighs> Back in the day, it wasn't it wasn't like that. Now, yeah. if somebody hit a three, like the crowd is oh, you know, you're down by twenty points. <laughs> three, <laughs> the crowd is standing on their feet for it. Yeah, it's the the I was watching um the podcast LeBron and JJ Reddick just put out mm-hmm. a podcast, yeah. and they were talking about how. This is essentially a the the imprint of Steph Curry on the game. It is, yeah. He's 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 changed this whole modern game. Yeah, yeah. How do you how do you feel about? And we're talking basketball now, but like the goat conversation. I don't think people understand. I feel like we got to change. The, you have to stop saying goat. The reason why is because people say, "Oh, there's two goats. You can't have two greatest no, of all time." Yeah. It's just the first la- off, that language doesn't exist. The language doesn't work. So it's not who's your goat. No, no. There is a goat and a favorite player. Yeah, right, right, right. You can make up whatever criteria you want for a goat, and then we could we could argue that. Uh, for me, the goat is MJ. I agree. Right, and it's probably because I was born in the eighties, um, but he's got the rings. If you can make the ring argument, which everybody does, even LeBron. So, if LeBron's playing the ring game, he's losing the ring game. Yeah. This is why he bounced around. Right, um, points. That's longevity based. It's not, it's not a criteria for me as well. Right. Like, if you play the longest, you get the most points. Right. Also, the game is way more three-pointers. So, the amount of three-pointers LeBron's shooting now. I mean, you got people moving up on the list now, and I'm like, really? <laughs> and it's all because of threes, right? Who is it? Um, was it Jalen Brown, who's above Larry Bird and threes yeah, yeah, and yeah, Celtics? Yeah. I'm like, come on, man. So, the threes have increased the scoring. So, the points out. Um, impact. You could say impact. So, like, on the team or impact on the game. Jordan, the biggest impact in ever. sports ever, right? Yeah. Le- nobody even buys LeBron's shoes. <laughs> like that. Which is the metric of right. like the basketball world, right? It's the shoe. Yeah. LeBron's never had like a dominant shoe. Right. Right. Jordan is still Jordan. For me, my favorite player is Kobe. Like I, I had the KB8s. I, you know, Kobe was like that draft, 96 draft class, best draft class ever. Class ever. That's Ray Allen. Kobe, Iverson, Marbury, Iverson. Kobe. Ooh. Marcus Camby, Steve Nash, Ray Allen, Samaki Walker, um, Kerry Kittles, another St. Nog product. So Kerry Kittles went number six in the Nets. That was what Kobe wanted to go with. They wanted Kobe, but he was uh, not going to come. Um, you just go down. That, that draft was crazy. So I was like super excited. I was like, um, I don't know, maybe I was in seventh grade. Mm-hmm. So I remember yeah. like that was it for us. And AI was like, everybody loved AI. But then Kobe was like, yeah, this little guy, whatever. I still remember I was a Lakers fan and I yeah. hated Kobe for missing those air balls. Because he was drafted 13th. 13th, yeah. Oh, originally by the Hornets. But Hornets, yeah. yeah. So the trade for Vladi. Yeah. And I remember watching the game, like, what the hell is he doing? Missing all these damn three pointers. Why did he keep shooting threes? Um, not realizing, like, this is about to be that dude. Like, he's just putting in the work now. Um, no, he wasn't scared at all. Yeah. And I remember, like, moving away from being an AI fan to a Kobe fan, like, by year two. Really? Yeah, year two. I mean, AI was still a man. Yeah, it was, he really was. But then you watch Kobe progress, and, like, Kobe was flashy. He was athletic. And, like, then you watch Kobe go from being that to being the man. Like, Don, Kobe's my favorite. I'm a huge fan of Kobe Bryant. Um, rest in peace. He, it was weird, because when he passed away, I remember, like, being properly sad. I was two weeks. I was, like, devastated. I was, yeah. Yeah, I, I was. was per- Passed away is not even the right way. Like, when yeah. he was literally taken away from from the world. Um, legitimately sad about it. Mm-hmm. Like, And I, I was so excited to see. Be, the Part of the reason, like, I think about this podcast now, I'm reflecting now. 
Kobe was a big story person. Yeah. Like he was all about like stories. Yeah. And if you, if you, if you listen to his, like the speeches he would give and he was all about like the, the, the behind the scene, yeah. the, 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 the work behind the people, the person behind, and he yeah. would always talk about it. And he won a, an Oscar for, uh, a, a short, yeah, yeah, for his short. Um, I felt like for so, for so much of his life to be basketball, mm -hmm. there was so much more. I thought the more, the most interesting parts of him mm -hmm. was off the court. Oh, off the court, yeah. And he, we, we just never got to see that. Yeah, the behind the scenes, like yeah. the stories of him at 4 a.m. and the two practices. And I don't know, I just, to me, that's my favorite. Because he came in the league, if you think about it, he was like, a Toyota Camry. Yeah. Like if you're going to do body wise, right? LeBron's probably physical specimen, one of the best ever. Yeah, Cadillac. Yeah. Kobe doesn't have Jordan hands. Decent vertical, not crazy, not super fast, decent ball handling skills. So maybe like a Lexus, I would say. Kobe finishes a Bugatti, right? Like there's not a lot of players that make that transformation. That's just all work. And yeah. I think for regular people to, to just be like, you know, he's the, the koi that becomes a dragon when he right, swims right, up the, right, the right, thing, right? right? That's why he's my favorite. LeBron has been the chosen one. And you have to give him some credit because the limelight has been on him since like a sophomore in high school and he's never wavered mm -hmm. and finished, right? Mm -hmm. But the slope was like that. Whereas Kobe's was kind of more like this and then it's just meteoric, right? I have friends that would accuse me of being a LeBron hater, but I would, I would make the case that I'm actually his biggest fan mm -hmm. because I expected more from him. Really? I, I did. On the court or in life? On, or? on the court. Okay. On the court. On the court. I think outside of the basketball court, I think he's done. Oh, yeah. LeBron off the court is, is the GOAT. Yeah. He's off the, the court, LeBron is the GOAT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But on a basketball court, I expected more from him. I don't think, give, in, in the context of being the greatest of all time, you cannot, just by raw observation and math, you cannot be the greatest of all time when your percentage leans so towards wins, loss. Yeah. yeah. You just can't when, yeah. when, and it's not that you're leaning towards loss in the case, in the case of like, it's not like in baseball when 30%, which is, you know, yeah, point three yeah, yeah. Is, is, is fantastic. Yeah. No, we have evidence of someone that has, is a hundred percent. Yeah. Like the person you're up against is a hundred percent. I don't care that you went there 10 times. Yeah. You lost. You lost more. Six of the times, six times, which is what Jordan won. All yeah. of it. Yeah. I, it, it does change the conversation. You, you can't, you can't, it's a, to me, it's a, we're letting him fly by with me. Like he should have done more. He shouldn't have lost against the Mavericks with the squad that he had. Yeah. Um, yeah. At least that, that. They shouldn't have, they shouldn't have lost that one. He shouldn't have lost that one. There are a couple, and, and you know, everyone is like, Oh, or the argument would be, Oh, he ran up against a super team in KD. He had a super team, but he had a, he had a, he had a squad too. I remember yeah. like a comparison between the players where, um, Point for point, or at least stat by stat, they had actually matched up. So LeBron and KD were a wash, um, essentially in the finals. LeBron and KD were a wash. Uh, Kyrie and Steph were a wash. And Clay and Kevin Love were a wash. Mm. So, like, essentially, evenly matched up. they were an evenly matched yeah. squad. And of, but, you know, you know, Steph isn't Kyrie, but Kyrie on his day is that's yeah. a bad man. Yeah, Kyrie is still legit. Yeah, He's Kyrie still is legit. legit. He's, he's the best. Ball handler ever. I think the I think the, the the saving grace for Kyrie is that he wasn't tall enough. I mean, he's the yeah. most skilled person basketball player I've ever seen. Yeah, if he was six five, six six, it'd be, it, it not it wouldn't be fair. Yeah, I agree with that hundred percent. Because yeah, Kyrie is different. <sighs> but I still agree with you. I think, and I'll be honest, the, the, my whole thing is I like my sports athletes. It's like psychopaths. Mm -hmm. Like want to win at no no matter what the cost, right? Like they will scratch like Gladiators. it's the gladiator, right? Yeah. I want to see them win. But I don't care. LeBron is like such a good human being. He will play the game the right way. And that's great like off the court. Yeah. I don't want to see when you step in that arena, I want to see the gladiator. I want to see the killer. Like I want to see the shark. Um, that's what I prefer as a fan. Same. And I know some people are like, oh no, like again, I want the Ray Lewis's out there. Like I want to see somebody trying to knock your head off, even though the game has changed, but that's what I want. Someone who wants to dominate you from beginning to end, and they yeah. don't care how you feel about it. Yeah, I think I think the goat thing is a media narrative, yeah. of course. Um, but and even LeBron himself pushing it himself also rubs me the wrong way. Yeah, you you just have to be a part of it. You can't you can't change the narrative, which he's kind of trying to do. But you played the game of ring chasing. 
Yeah. You don't have Kobe's number and you don't have MJ's number. Still. Right? Now, I would say MJ's one. I'll put Kobe and LeBron, you know, 2A, 2B. And again, I have a preference for Kobe and a lot of people have a preference for LeBron. So I can, I can see that anyway. But you can't put LeBron above Jordan. Nah. The influence, the impact. You know, the whole narrative now is how crappy the 90s were or that MJ had no left hand. But then you go look at the advanced statistics, MJ went left more of the time and had a higher yeah. percentage fin- finishing. So, like, now you're just trying to change the story up on yeah, trying to change the narrative. Yeah. Up. So, I'm, I don't know. LeBron got to get out of here. Because they're going <laughs> to they find a way to put LeBron above MJ if he gets another ring. I just saw, oh, yeah, for sure. I, I just saw a stat that um, LeBron, I think two nights ago, mm-hmm. just past Mike just past Michael Jordan for the most 30 point um mm. most 30 point games um in league history just LeBron has played 21 seasons yeah I I do give LeBron LeBron's probably the best older patient um player ever. player ever it's not even close yeah like that is different but that's for him legacy chasing yeah yeah but not just that it's it's I feel like LeBron also has the benefit of modern everything yeah Modern. Look, LeBron has also been eating fruit since he was in high school. Like <laughs> his AAU team was like, LeBron's not eating McDonald's with us. Right, right, right. Like right. this dude has been thinking about this day for so long. He's been doing it. Yeah, he's been putting the work. So you, you, it's impressive that someone has the longevity. Like mm-hmm. that is different. Um, and I have to give him credit for that. Like he's very forward thinking. But like it's it's all crafted, you know? The whole LeBron is always on the first page of every book he reads. Like that <laughs> meme is still hilarious to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, gl- I'm glad he's promoting reading, but like dude, I've never seen LeBron in the middle of a book. He's so it's so funny because I saw uh, somebody was saying he, on the podcast with JJ Reddick, uh-huh. he said something like, "You know, I play chess." He's, this is the yeah. quote. He's like, "I play chess," and then he said, "I think he caught himself." He was like, "Not in real life, like, <laughs> but in my mind, I play chess and I'm the basketball I play chess." And people always tell me I should play chess. That's what he said. Yeah. And, I'm just like, come on, LeBron. You know the whole meme about him. <laughs> like he, he has a great basketball IQ and memory. Yeah, right. Like he can recall yeah. crazy stuff in basketball. But like, you know, I asked him about the was it the Goodfellas, and he just could not tell you what the story is about. He's like, oh, I rewatch it all the time during the playoffs. How's your basketball memory so good? Your real life memory horrible. <laughs> like, again, he's a basketball savant. You LeBron gotta give it to him. But yeah, he's just still <laughs> lying, man. It's all a narrative with LeBron. But right. uh, you know, hey, he he's got a good narrative. Oh my goodness. Well. Thank you so much. This was good. This yeah. was good. We we need we need a strictly sports and basketball episode when we just yeah <laughs> man Let, let's let's do that. Yeah. Let's, maybe if the Pels get in the finals, if the Pels <laughs> get to the finals, actually I'll take the Western Conference. If they make oh, it, we should do a, a, a episode on yeah. just talking about the Pels. Let's do and that. How we got there. Let's do that. Thank you so much. Oh no problem. Thanks fun. man. Yes sir. Good. I appreciate you. Same here. <laughs> How'd we do? Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of The Last Zebra. As always, please don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and share. We have new episodes every Monday morning on all of your favorite podcast platforms, and new episodes show up on YouTube on Tuesday mornings. Looking forward to seeing you guys on the next one.